I would like to introduce Tina Hefner, um, who will be providing uh, an introduction for today's event. Tina is a professor in the Department of Middle, Secondary, and K-12 Education at the University of North Carolina, Charlotte. Her administrative responsibilities include directing the MED in Secondary Education and the PhD in Curriculum and Instruction. She's also, uh, in 2019-2020, the president of the National Council for the Social Studies and was the 2015-2016 chair of the NCSS College and University Faculty Assembly. You can see her full bio in the digital program that we sent around to you, but we're incredibly excited to have NCSS as one of our co-sponsors and to have Dr. Hefner here to provide an introduction. So thank you so much. So on behalf of the National Council for the Social Studies, it is an honor to welcome you to a co-convening of the National Summit on Religion and Education. I want to specifically thank the Religious Freedom Center and extend a special note of gratitude to Ben Marcus for organizing this convening. Today we seek to not only understand the state of religious studies and education, but to also explore how educators are teaching about religion and what might we do to elevate religious studies in American public schools. I offer my introductory remarks to center our conversations on the work ahead by addressing three specific questions. Why is teaching about religion important to the National Council for the Social Studies? Why have we made minimal progress in changing the role of religious studies in public schools? And why is teaching about religion important? So why is teaching about religion important to the National Council for the Social Studies? In 1963, the US Supreme Court decision, NCSS took up the mantle of understanding uh, how we could guide educators and teaching about religion in schools. In 1988, we affirmed the study of religion is essential to the understanding of the nation and the world. Between, 2000, between 1980s and 2000, we spearheaded the development of state standards that included the study of religion within the curriculum of the social studies. We formalized this in 1994 when we issued and published our national standards, the 10 thematic strands for the social studies. These standards define that social studies exist for the promotion of civic competence and calls upon disciplinary knowledge and reasoning from various subjects and explicitly calling out religion as one of those subjects. In 2000, NCSS was part of a national initiative to disseminate the guidelines for teaching about religion. And in 2014, we issued a position statement on the study about religions in the social studies curriculum, affirming that the study about religions should be an essential part of the social studies curriculum. It is necessary for effective and engaged citizens, citizenship in a diverse world and nation. In 2017, NCSS published the Religious Studies Companion document to the College Career and Civic Life Framework. In reaffirming our longstanding position, NCSS states, religion is an essential part of social studies curriculum in ways that are constitutionally and academically sound. For NCSS, the study of religion from an academic, non-devotional perspective is primary, in primary, middle, and secondary school is critical for decreasing religious illiteracy and the bigotry and prejudice it fuels. In 2019, NCSS published a bulletin edited by Charles Haynes. You actually have this on your table, and this is our gift to you. Teaching about religion in the social studies classroom. In the introduction, Charles notes, that the ignorance and fear breed hate and violence. Religious literacy matters because peaceful coexistence and religious freedom matter. He continues, the historic failure to get religion right in public education has created de facto religious studies in America, dominated by the ethos and practices of schools. Despite all of these educational efforts by NCSS and others to promote teaching about religion and policy, Religion, policymakers, administrators, and teachers continue to avoid teaching religion or teaching about religion. Religion in schools largely remains at a very surface level and without deep understanding, critical dialogue, or inquiry. So this is my second question. So why have we made minimal progress in changing the role of religious studies in schools? So before I attempt to answer this, let me share a story with you. So a few weeks ago, I was sitting in a gas station getting my brakes replaced. Knowing that I would be sitting for a very long time, I wanted to find the only seat that was located near an electrical outlet. While I hoped that this would be productive work time, the man who sat next to me had a different agenda. He was also getting his brakes replaced and was seeking an opportunity to talk. So after learning about the man's job, he's an accountant, 
and why he moved to North Carolina. He was a government contractor. He shared his story of the decision that he made to send his son to a Christian school. He explained that when he moved to North Carolina, school districts were integrating schools from segregated communities through busing. Rather than attending the affluent white school in their neighborhood, his son was to be a bus to an adjacent city to attend an inner city black school. The man, confessing his prejudice and naivete of his younger years, also commented this was the best decision he'd ever made for his son. He went on to explain that his son was a highly successful pediatrician and attributed his son's success to his faith-based schooling. Ironically, his son is a doctor in the same practice where I take my children. Having established this personal connection, he leaned in and said, did you know, referring to both teachers and students, they can't have a Bible in schools? Did you know that they can't even pray in schools? That's a problem. Look at our coins. They say, in God we trust. And even our pledge acknowledges we are one nation under God. It's, referring to a singular religion, part of our country's foundation from the beginning of this nation. Even our founding fathers, and I put in quotes, were believers. For most people in the Bible Belt, where I grew up, this is an invitation to have a conversation about faith. However, I decided to have a conversation about history and religion. I responded, did you know that the phrase under God wasn't added to the Pledge of Allegiance until June 14, 1954? Dwight D. Eisenhower, having been inspired by a sermon, A New Birth of Freedom, in February 1954, uh, embraced Reverend Dockery's message that, quote, there was something missing from this, ple this pledge, the characteristic definitive factor in the American way of life. Dockery eloquently argued that the missing words were under God based on a threat of tyranny of Russia and that one should distinguish one's national oath from that and loyalty from that of another. Dockery drew on the distinction between the USSR and the USA, claiming that the godlessness of communism and the American belief in a deity. In just four months after hearing Dockery's sermon, the House and the Senate, by unanimous vote, approved a law adding under God to the Pledge of Allegiance. Questions about church and state or religious freedom were not voiced in either the House or Senate floor debates. Eisenhower presidency is also marked with the National Prayer, uh, National Prayer Breakfast and replaced E Pluribus Unum in the, with In God we, Cru we Trust as our national motto. Religion in 1950s America suddenly became fashionable and was, quote, more socially respectful, if not less spiritually intense. In an era of heightened inten tensions, historians argue that Americans were seeking spiritual, not just patriotic guidance from the government, marking this era as a time of American civil religion. So we discuss the consequences of religion and the misperceptions that the consequences of the civic consequences of religion and the misperceptions that emerge from lack of knowledge. Cognitive scientists draw upon the distinction between factual knowledge and process knowledge and argue that one cannot be critical or engage in critical thinking without having something to think critically about. Now, at this point, I'm sure he wanted to sit somewhere else. <laughs> the story didn't end there. The period, this period of American history is also marked by Supreme Court decisions. McCollum, Zorick, Engel, Abington uh, Township uh, School District, all affirming that schools may not endorse or teach religion, but this did not preclude the academic pursuit of religion. The court's decision consistently upheld the importance of schools' religious free exercise while establishing the pro prohibition of establishment of religion in the classroom. I continue to talk about the Constitution and the first freedoms of religious liberty. I explained the distinction between teaching about religion and teaching religion, which he'd never heard before. Clarifying that religious studies is a critical part of understanding the human experience, and religions are intricately woven into the fabric of identity, society, and culture. I stated that the study of religion is foundational education. It is critical component of social studies education. Given that I work with pre-service and in-service teachers who do teach about religion, I clarified their rights and the rights of public school children. I went on to discuss the complexity of religion and religious practices and how we need to develop a deeper understanding of those to be able to have those critical conversations in our communities. Our conversations concluded after many hours, and as we said our goodbyes, I handed him my business card from NCSS. I share this story first because stories are cognitively privileged, but I also share it because it reveals, in my opinion, the perpetuated myths about religion and education, particularly in public education, and those held by those inside and outside of our educational system. 
As a teacher educator, I find far too often I'm in the business of myth busting, just like the conversation I shared with you. So why do these myths persist? Why do educators, administrators, school boards, and others continue to avoid religious studies or diminish teaching about religion in the social studies curriculum? What is the relation of these myths to society? Perhaps the issue resides in how we communicate importance. In the September 2019 issue of Social Education, and I would encourage you to read this article, Justine Ellis and Ben Marcus argue that much dialogue has occurred about the what and the how of religious studies, but little attention has been given to the why. From the field of cognitive scientists, understanding the why behind our instructional decision making is an important part of learning praxis and transference. As Ellis and Marcus contend, what we need to do, not, we need to not only address the what and the how of teaching about religion and social studies, but we must also articulate why teaching about religion matters. So why is teaching about religion important? Let me respond at how NCSS would respond. August 16th, 2019, just last month, NCSS issued a statement, a response to mass shootings. I quote from this statement. Mass shootings constitute new incarcerations of systemic issues that plague the United States. The severity and prevalence of the crisis in the United States is beyond compare. We must confront the ideologies which mass shooters identify, including white supremacy, xenophobia, among others. NCSS notes that social media platforms have contributed to the radicalization and amplification of extremist views. So why is teaching about religion important? I contend that we have yet to formalize that answer as a field. I also wonder if we struggle with why, and our struggle re with why resides in the fact that we have focused far more on how, on the process, with not as much attention to what. So what is the purpose of this summit on religion and education? The summit brings together various stakeholders and educational power brokers who have come together to lead with foresight who seek to address the why of religion and education and to conceptualize what we should be doing. In closing, I leave you with more questions as fodder for conversations today and beyond and, I, and a call to action that we seek to address and find in a concerted efforts answers to these. So here are my questions. What have we learned from the efforts to educate the community and educational professionals about religion and religious studies? How do we come together to talk about religion, but to also talk about the intersectionality of religion and public life, and taking into account this international variations? What might teaching about religion and education look like in schools and our communities if we focused on the civic consequences of religion? How might we teach about the elements of religion that show up in civic life, and that more importantly vary by topic and religion? How might we message the civic and life importance of religion and education in a manner that changes the culture of schooling to embrace rather than to avoid the teaching about religion? And finally, as a society that privileges divisiveness and disagreement over consensus and tolerance, how might we empower educators working, living, and educating in a pluralistic society with the knowledge, skills, and dispositions to promote civil and critical dialogue? civility and inclusion, religious freedom and religious liberty in the classroom and beyond. Thank you. Good morning again. Good morning. And welcome to this exciting and distinguished panel that you have before you. Uh, we have John Camardella, Maha Elgenady, Sarah Ben Levy Brighton, Ben Marcus and Mike Wagoner. And um, they're going to each take about seven to 10 minutes. Our goal is to broadly establish the scope of K to 12 religious education, what resources are available and what's happening. So we'll give each of them seven to 10 minutes and then have questions and hopefully you will have questions and conversation points as we go forward. And I do want to note that Ben already took eight of our minutes. I'm sorry. But that's okay, <laughs> that's okay. We'll still make this happen. Great. We'll forgive you. Okay. Uh, we, we aren't going in the order in which they're sitting though. We're starting with Mike Wagner, who's professor of education at the University of North Carolina. Mike? You, you can sit with the laws if you don't have, you don't need to stand, or you, you're welcome to. Okay. 
be standing. Yeah, that's right. And it's the University of Northern Iowa, I must I'm say. sorry. That's mm -hmm. probably right. First mistake I ever made. <laughs> <laughs> well, good morning again. <clears throat> I've been asked to provide a bit of historical context for uh, the work of which we're all a part. I think it's because Ben thought I could draw upon personal memory deep back into the 20th century. <laughs> And uh, while, I, while the intermingling of religion and education is, is millennia old, uh, for our purposes and the time available, I want to highlight what I think is uh, more recently pertinent. I'll attempt this in my seven to ten minutes, uh, one minute per decade over 70 years. So buckle up. Pertinent to our story from the 40s is the Weekday Religious Education, uh, WRE program where students move to a different classroom uh, once a week for religious instruction from their respective teach, uh, churches. Operated under the auspices of the International Council of Religious Education, a multi-faith umbrella group, um, WRE had grown from a quarter million in 1935 to more than one and a half million students in 1946 in over 2,000 school districts. Now, when challenged in Champaign, Illinois in 1946, the court upheld WRE. However, two years later, in McCollum v. Board of Education, the Supreme Court struck down the lower court ruling as unconstitutional on establishment grounds, citing public school administration's organizational and physical involvement in the delivery of religious instruction. The seeds of what we experience yet today were sown during this program's life, however, as the content of what was taught became contested territory between mainline Protestants emphasizing social justice and fundamentalists focusing on individual salvation of souls. In the wake of the McCollum decision, little happened. WRE continued through the 1950s, with most districts conducting WRE failing to enforce uh, the decision or seemingly unable to. In fact, by 1959, WRE enrollments reached 4 million. Other districts attempting to comply soon found the loophole uh, that uh, the McCollum decision did not apply to out-of-school hours or off-site instruction. This was codified in the Supreme Court <coughs> decision in 1952, Zorich v. Clausen, where such instruction was deemed constitutional. In a parallel development, uh, some who faced, uh, who feared religious instruction being pushed out of public schools sought to infuse religion into the whole school experience by introducing mandatory Bible reading and recitation of the Lord's Prayer. In the same year as Zorich, the Supreme Court let stand a lower New Jersey court ruling in Dormus v. Board of Education, where such Bible reading and the Lord's Prayer were allowed and deemed non-sectarian. Still other parallel experimentation in the 50s involved the search for a broad common core moral and spiritual values approach that could be embraced by all faith traditions. Now, Out of these competing 1950s attempts to deal with McCollum, the Supreme Court further complicated the religion and education milieu in the 60s with perhaps the most famous of the decisions in this arena the 62-63 state-sponsored prayer and Bible reading decisions, Engel and then Shemp. Disallowing state-sponsored prayer and Bible reading on establishment grounds, Justice Clark, in his majority opinion, also emphasized the desirability of the study of comparative religion and the Bible as long as it occurred within a secular, non-devotional program of study. Two takes on these decisions would provide launch points that, like the distinct approaches of WRE, are alive and at work today. We in this room represent that branch off the Clark comment, I believe. The other is championed by those outraged by the court decisions and who are pursuing a more uh, Trojan horse evangelistic approach to a conservative Christian presence in public schools. Our line of work was begun in the 60s in the wake of these decisions, but formalized in the 70s. 
1971, the staff of the National Council of Churches uh, convened a meeting in New York City to take up the issue of religion in public <coughs> education. During that meeting, 40 organizations voted unanimously to form the National Council for Religion and Public Education, NCRPE, to provide means for uh, cooperative action among organizations concerned with religion as a constitutionally acceptable and educationally appropriate part of the secular program of public instruction. The first such national multi-faith interdisciplinary organization with such a mission. An initial uh, newsletter became in 1974, the NCRPE Bulletin, which in turn became the journal Religion and Public Education, that is now Religion and Education, the journal for which I have been privileged to serve as editor since 2000. NCRPE, however, uh, disbanded after 20 years in 1994. Other initiatives took shape in parallel. In 1981, the American Academy of Religion uh, published the volume Public Education Religion Studies, an overview uh, led by uh, editor and professor Nick Pidioscalzi, who since the 70s had operated the Public Education Religion Studies Center at Wright State University. AAR had a program group devoted to this subject for some years. Uh, it disbanded but reformed in the last 12 years as the program group Religion and Public Schools International Perspectives. Uh, Bruce Grelly was uh, a founder of this group along with uh, Danish professor Tim Jensen and Eric Owens uh, also instrumental in that work. Among the significant developments in the 90s was the creation of the California 3Rs project for rights, responsibilities, and respect uh, facilitated by T Charles Haynes, uh, growing out of the reactions to the new California history social science framework introduced in 1988. This project, among other objectives, related to the first, uh, to first Amendment issues, emphasizing that, uh, quote, students must become familiar with the basic ideas of the major religions and ethical traditions of each time and place, end quote. Nick Pietascalzi, I mentioned, uh, just mentioned, uh, had retired to California and became that project's uh, first director. The three R subsequently developed a program in Utah and now is at work in Georgia. Uh, Charles again is at work in this, is David Calloway, the directs it, Emil Lester, as you heard, is evaluated, and Kevin Burke's involved as well. Uh, the Modesto, California uh, required world religions course is the most significant developments, one of the most significant developments to, to begin the 2000s. Uh, Emil Lester uh, richly tells this story in his 2011 book, Teaching About Religion and Democratic Approach for Public Schools. I date our current period from 2007. This year saw the issuance of four important publications, at least, uh, pertinent to our work. Uh, Religious Literacy by Steve Prothrow, Overcoming Religious Literacy, a Cultural Studies Approach by Diane Moore, uh, Finding Common Ground, a Guide to Religious Liberty in Public Schools uh, by Charles Haynes and Oliver Thomas, and the European Initiative, the Toledo Guiding Principles for Teaching About Religion and Beliefs in Public Schools. We should note that Charles Haynes was also uh, one, if not the only, U.S. advisor <coughs> to that uh, European project. So you see there's a through line here of uh, <laughs> Charles, we all knew. About uh, that time also, the American Academy of Religion began a three-year process to develop its own set of guidelines uh, for teaching about religion, religion in the schools. They were approved and distributed in 2010, and thank you, for uh, Alice, for providing those. Also in 2007, the Society for Biblical Literature uh, began the Bible in Secondary Schools Task Force that would produce constitutionally appropriate guidelines and materials uh, for elective Bible courses in the schools. And thank you for uh, providing that as well. And Mark Chancy was uh, instrumental in both the SBL and AAR guideline development. Now most recently, I'm not rehearsing, by the way, the NCSS uh, contributions. The team did such a great job in outlining that all the way along. Uh, so in the interest of time, I'm not. <laughs> uh, most recently, 
uh, this religious freedom center, Harvard's uh, religious literacy project, to name just two, have produced uh, programs and resources contributing to the strand of work that came out of Justice Clark's encouragement uh, towards constitutional teaching about religion in the public schools. So I see a through line for our work from at least the 1940s, contesting what about religion should be taught in the public schools. Uh, there has been an ebb and flow of actors and organizations uh, over these years, and I believe we are in this stream. I'm encouraged by the flurry of activity in these recent years and look forward to what is next. Thank you. Indeed, a decade a minute. <laughs> now we'll hear from Ben Marcus, who is Religious Literacy Specialist for the Religious Freedom Center Freedom Forum. Great, so I'll sit if that's okay. Um, and I'll try to be brief so that we, uh, since I ate up time it's before, okay, I'll try to be brief now. I uh, wanted to take some time just to talk about the snapshot of where we are today or where I see the field today by breaking it into three main areas, uh, policy, training, and curricular resources. So at the policy level, I think we've made really great strides. Uh, Mike has already mentioned a number of the documents that I think of as policy documents which lay out some guidelines for how to teach about religion. Those include, of course, the 2010 guidelines from the American Academy of Religion, the Toledo Guiding Principles from the OSCE. Uh, SBL produced their own um, booklet for how to teach about the Bible constitutionally in public schools. And then, of course, the 2017 guidelines, which I had the pl uh, privilege of working on for the Religious Studies Companion document. Um, so, I know that the, the afternoon panel will be talking about the future of religious studies education, but just to hint towards some of those things, where I do not see policy or guidelines are specifically ELA-focused policies and guidelines, for example, or policies and guidelines that speak to what it means to talk about religion in um, STEM classes or outside the social studies. So I think that that will be an incredibly uh, important area for us to examine throughout the day, what are the policies and guidelines that do not exist, and what are the guidelines that do exist, and how do they, how can we bring those uh, two, two things into conversation with one another. In terms of uh, training, I've been relatively astounded in the last few years how many opportunities there are for in-service teachers who are interested in training for teaching about religion. And um, <coughs> I can rattle off you know, the organizations that provide them. Many of them are in this room, including us at the Religious Freedom Center, the Religious Literacy Project. Um, there are two NEH-funded in-service training programs, one at the Interfaith Center of New York, one at UCLA. Um, I know Rice University, the Boniac Institute, provides its own in-service training program. And then teachers have stepped up, not noting that there aren't enough opportunities. John Camardella is one of those teachers. Um, of course, Chris Murray is one of those teachers in Maryland. Uh, DCPS has provided uh, in-service training programs for professional development days. Um, one of my, our colleagues in Illinois, Seth Brady, so there are, and, and Kelly O'Reilly with the Uberoi Foundation, there are different kinds of in-service training programs all around the country for teachers who are interested in teaching about religion. I think that's relatively new. For a long time, I think there were a few organizations, just a handful or less, who are providing in-service training. Um, what I see as a challenge or an opportunity perhaps going forward is that uh, we should be really thinking about pre-service training. And I think there's a lot less happening at the pre-service level. Um, that schools of education have not uh, perhaps had the opportunity or, or the bandwidth uh, to teach about religion. There are many demands on pre-service educators' time. There are many things that they have to learn. And I know that all of us who are in this room probably think that, uh, agree that it's impossible to train a social studies educator without training them to think about religious studies. And so uh, to me, that's a real opportunity, um, both at the pre-service training level and also at the policy level. So I mentioned policy before. For example, uh, there were just guidelines released. I believe it was unfortunately a parallel process when the 2017 guidelines for teaching about religion were being developed. There was also a parallel process where uh, social studies educators were coming together to come up with guidelines for what uh, social studies educators should know when they graduate with their certificate. And unfortunately, those guidelines don't explicitly name religious studies as a key component 
of what social studies education should include. Um, and then, of course, there's resources. So resources, again, here we see an almost cottage industry of organizations that are trying to provide resources for educators who are interested in teaching about religion. I travel all around the country and abroad uh, talking about the importance of, of teaching about religion. And when we talk about sort of guidelines, the concepts, the skills that it requires to teach about religion, um, that's fundamental and incredibly important. But the first question that I get is what resources are you providing me uh, to do this? And of course, there are a number of organizations that are trying to provide those resources. I know Steve right now is working on a textbook, um, I believe at the lower uh, sort of early college level for teaching about religion. Um, there are lesson plans and text sets that we're developing at the Religious Freedom Center, the Religious Literacy Project. I know Sarah Ben will talk about in a moment all the different kinds of resources that you're developing. Uh, and then uh, the Bible Odyssey, right? SBL has stepped up. They're providing resources for uh, teaching about the Bible in public school classrooms. The Pluralism Project provides case studies that can be used in public schools. And then a project that I'm working on, um, International Baccalaureate. I think this is one of the more exciting things happening at the moment, that International Baccalaureate uh, has currently what is called a world religions class. And, and Diane and I and a number of teachers I've been working with IB to retool that curriculum, and I think it will be a real gold standard for what it looks like to teach about religion in the high school classroom. Um, but of course, there's so much more that we could do, and a, a number of different organizations here that represent um, uh, different religious communities, at sort of the intersection of religious communities and educational organizations are providing resources for teaching about Hinduism in the classroom, or Sikhism, or, or other um, religious traditions. So, Right now, I see uh, the field as very, um, uh, there's not a center of gravity, perhaps. And, and so one of the things, our, our goals for bringing people together today was to create a bit of a center of gravity, to create a feeling that there's actually a field here. Um, I know when I travel around the country, people think that they're uh, the only ones doing this kind of work. They feel like they're working in silos. And that's in part because we don't do a very good job as a field of talking about who else is in the field, who else is here, how can we support one another. And so I'm hoping that with today's conversation, we can develop some ideas about how we can project to ourselves and also to the public that there is an entire um, field here, that there are people in higher education, in K-12 education, in schools. There are religious-based uh, professional development providers, <coughs> civil society professional development providers, um, who are all committed to teaching about religion in K-12 education. And I think that that will make a difference as well. Great. Thank you, Ben. We'll hear from uh, Maha el Janadi, who's the founder and executive director of the Islamic Networks Group. Thank you so much. Um, I'm wondering whether there's a video screen on that side of the room as well? There is. There is. Okay, wonderful. So I am going to operate my computer alongside this one, and hopefully I'll get this right. So <laughs> forgive me if I, if I screw up. Um, so good morning. Um, I run an organization that's actually been around for 27 years, and we provide education um, about various religions. But the focus, our core competency really is um, education about Muslims and their faith, and we do it to supplement very specific content standards in both middle and high school. Um, and so I'm going to talk a little bit about that, and I'm also going to talk about the expansion of that work to uh, teaching about the five major world religions alongside uh, each other. And so the title of this presentation is Community Support for Education about Religion um, in Schools. I want to begin first with the context, which is an incredibly important topic for the folks that are teaching about religion because you have to take into consideration what's actually happening in the communities uh, about uh, uh, the kids that you are, uh, that you are uh, teaching about or about the people that you're teaching about. The current environment for Muslim Americans um, is uh, not uh, very good and it hasn't uh, really improved uh, since we started the organization in 1993. Um, so based on a very recent uh, poll, Muslims rated most negatively with an average rating of 48 when you compare uh, how Americans view them uh, in comparison to other uh, groups in the country. The good news is that knowing a person 
in a faith group leads to warmer feelings, and which is why engagement with community members in teaching about religion becomes incredibly uh, important. Um, the consequences of the current environment, as you might imagine, is hate crimes and discrimination. Nearly half of all Muslim Americans and 64% of those that um, identify as Muslim, someone like me who wears the hijab, 64% uh, experience some form of discrimination. Um, and of course, um, hate crimes against Muslims have um, increased <clears throat> exponentially, especially in the last several years uh, since the presidential uh, elections. The impact on Muslim American students, as you might imagine, is bullying, harassment, teasing, and, um, and so forth. Um, according to studies, 53% of respondents report that students are made fun of, insulted, uh, or abused for being a Muslim. In other communities that I've been to, it's up to uh, eight out of 10. Uh, kids have experienced some form um, of harassment, being called names, um, and oftentimes that actually happens by the adults in the school, by the teachers, by the administrators. Um, classroom discussions, according to the um, similar studies, the percentage of Muslim students who do not feel comfortable in class discussions about Islam and Muslims increased by 50% between uh, 214 and 216. Um, and as I said, um, oftentimes it's really the teacher and the staff and the administrators that participate in this. 57% um, of Muslim American students see other students posting offensive uh, statements about Muslims on uh, social uh, media. Now take this and um, with the challenges that confront educators when teaching about religion in schools that include understanding the study of religion, which we've been talking about, um, I think oftentimes teachers will teach uh, religion as something that is very essential, that isn't uh, diverse, uh, particularly when it comes to the study of Islam. Um, they don't really consider the fact that there are 55 Muslim majority nations in the world and all of them uh, you know, have, a, have a, a sort of a, a diverse understanding of, um, of their faith. But that diversity and that pluralism within the community of Muslims doesn't really come out in, the, in, in that education. It's usually uh, presented in a very monolithic uh, way. Adequate resources for teaching about religion, particularly on a, a religion like Islam, is, um, is, is, is uh, not, not adequate. Um, interpreting current events in the news as you're teaching about religion is something that is very challenging for teachers. Uh, of course, teacher biases and very little time that is, um, that is allowed for, for this uh, study. So community resources. Uh, my organization started, uh, as I said, in 1993 at the tail end of the first Persian Gulf War when my community began to record hate crimes against Muslims and, uh, and Arab Americans. And um, what we found to be incredibly effective is staff awareness of religion, which it Ben just uh, spoke about. So we do quite a bit of uh, cultural diversity education for, uh, for teachers on Muslims um, and uh, their faith. It's a two-hour training that we do that doesn't just cover resources, but it also covers education about Muslims, who they are, uh, based on their own understanding of their own uh, tradition. So we cover things like terminology and demographics, the fact that Muslims are quite diverse, spread over uh, 55 Muslim-majority countries. We go over the founding and the history, the teachings, the values, and most importantly, the relationship to other traditions. And then we address common misconceptions, extremism, women, pluralism, um, and so forth, before we even address uh, different resources that they, can, um, th that they have access to. Um, and then we provide two incredibly successful programs. Um, the first year that we did this, we got requests from about 300 educators to come out to their schools. We had no idea that there was uh, so much interest. So we provide uh, two things, speakers bureaus and online curriculum and other resources. Uh, the Islamic Speakers Bureau has probably been the most successful uh, uh, program that we've had. And we provide uh, presentations on four uh, principal topics, getting to know American Muslims and their faith, which um, supplements uh, the standards in seventh grade, at least, in the state of California that addresses the history um, of, uh, of Islam and the spread of Islam around the world. Muslim Contributions to Civilization addresses cultural interactions between the East and the West, uh, providing information that is not covered at all in the um, in, in textbooks. A History of Muslims in America addresses 
uh, the Atlantic slave trade, immigration policy, um, <coughs> and the fact that up to 30% uh, of the enslaved Africans uh, in this country were, were in fact uh, Muslims and the contribution of those Muslims throughout history. Muslim women beyond uh, the stereotypes that begins by looking at the status of Muslims uh, around the, sa the status of Muslim women around the world and complicates that conversation and doesn't just look at it as, uh, as uh, in, in, in the way that it's usually presented. Um, and then we've developed duplicate presentations and tools for teen Muslims because we discovered that the children in the schools that are experiencing bullying can actually be empowered and enabled to do this work. And so we've developed presentations where adults give 45 minute presentations. Kids now have access to uh, 15, 20 minute presentations that they can get up and, um, and deliver. And we've certified about 100 um, uh, Muslim teen speakers uh, to do that across the country. And this program is really growing. And since 9-11, we've uh, realized that in order to increase Islamic literacy, you really have to increase religious literacy. In other words, the more that Christians understand their religion and the diversity that exists within their religion, they'll have an understanding of the diversity that exists within Islam um, and so forth. And so we created an interfaith uh, speakers bureau. It now reflects about 40% of the work that we do. And these are the topics that we talk about. Living the faith is probably uh, the most um, uh, often requested uh, panel. Shared values among faith, religion, and extremism is also incredibly uh, powerful, and it's incredibly powerful because of what's happening in the world today. So our Hindu speakers talk about Hindu uh, nationalism and Hindu extremism in India. Our Buddhist speakers address what's happening in Burma, Sri Lanka, and Thailand. Um, our Christian speaker will address things like the culture wars that are happening here in the United States and other uh, Christian extremism um, and so forth. And it's incredibly important to be able to have these conversations and to, and, and, and to address current events at the same time talking about the normative teachings that exist within these religions. Peacemaking and religion separation of church and state has become an incredibly popular topic now. We also have Muslim Jewish panels that uh, surprisingly don't, under, don't address the Palestinian-Israeli conflict as much as they address the shared uh, concerns and interests of Jews and Muslims being the two largest religious minorities in the United States, an incredibly successful panel. And then the Muslim Jewish Sikh panel um, addresses some of the hate crimes and the bullying that impacts these three communities um, right now. Um, and then we also have uh, the same exact material that we've made available to educators. For those educators that are concerned about bringing a, um, a speaker from the community, we've provided them with the PowerPoints, with the scripts, with ideas for activities and, and, um, and uh, films, uh, media that they can use, questions uh, that they can uh, use for discussion. Um, and so forth, and, and our material is now downloaded in, in, in 48 states by um, educators across the country, which is uh, very exciting. The key thing about our speakers uh, our program, Speakers Bureau program, is in the training and the certification. We were very fortunate to have met uh, Shabir Mansouri about 27 years ago, who was working with uh, Charles Haynes, and I came to know Charles Haynes later, so we've implemented all of his work, we've integrated all of his work in the speakers training that we do and the certification that we do. So all of our speakers abide by the First Amendment Center guidelines and I'm sure that you're all familiar, familiar with what those are. Incredibly important and I think it's the, really the key to success of the organization. I haven't been using this at all, have I? Oh my goodness. You see, I told you that I would screw it up. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> oh dear. Let me quickly go forward. Uh, I'm yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there was a lot here, though, that I really wanted to share. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> These are beautiful slides. <laughs> it worked all night. <laughs> um, okay, going back. I think, yeah, so the, uh, you know, the First Amendment Center guidelines are, I think it's probably something that all of you know, and how to, you know, how to teach about religion um, in, in the schools, the importance of remaining academic, not devotional, um, the importance of exposing um, students to diversity of religious views and, um, and, and so forth. And I really think that that's uh, probably the key to our, um, to our success, uh, is that in 
the training and certification, which are full days, uh, we train them on this and we make sure that uh, we test them on this as well. And we've had to get rid of speakers, uh, mo mostly from the Christian and the Buddhist communities, uh, because they just were not able to present their religions without proselytizing. Um, all of our presentations are scripted and they supplement very specific content standards. And the panels are always facilitated by an ING um, staff uh, person, which uh, we feel is incredibly um, important. Um, and then also we have online answers to frequently asked questions um, about Islam, which is um, number one now in Google searches, and it is uh, frequently visited by, uh, by educators, uh, we're told. And we just uh, developed a back-to-school kit that um, combines all of these resources by, uh, by teacher, administrator, and parents just to make it easier for uh, for them to access. Now, very quickly, uh, you know, what is, what is the impact? Uh, believe it or not, we, this is how many we do just in the San Francisco Bay Area. Now, we have affiliates across the country in about 17 states. They're much smaller than we are, but just in the San Francisco Bay Area, we average about two of these uh, presentations and panels um, a day, or 750 um, in the Bay Area. And then the impact in terms of the change of perception, it's phenomenal. We do quite a bit of impact studies uh, to look at whether we are uh, improving uh, perceptions about, uh, about Muslims or not, and we find that, um, that we are. And the impact for the Interfaith uh, Speakers Bureau has also been quite phenomenal in that it's not just changing perceptions about Muslims, <coughs> but it's also about Jews and Hindus primarily for the better and uh, respondents um, now understand these faith and see that many commonalities between them and that despite their differences, you know, gee, they really get along really well. Um, and it's something that really surprises um, uh, the kids. The other aspect of this work is parent engagement. We do quite a bit of education with parents, encouraging them to uh, be involved uh, in their schools in a variety of different ways I put up on the slide. Um, and then, of course, the volunteer to speak in the classroom, provided that they're trained um, to do it. And so this is just uh, one of many models uh, that exist. I know that we've influenced the Hindu American Foundation to do something very similar. We've influenced the Sikh uh, Coalition to do something very similar, and they just started a Speakers Bureau in our area, and we're gonna be working with them. We've also influenced the JCRC, the Jewish Community Relations Council in my area, uh, to do the same work uh, as well. The key thing is the, is, is the training and the certification to make sure that they're abiding by the um, First Amendment Center guidelines for how to do this work. Thank you. Thank you, Maha. We, we now have Sarah Ben Levy Brighton, former boots on the ground teacher <laughs> and currently Senior Curriculum Resource and Training Associate for the Religious Literacy Project at Harvard. Okay, we'll see if I remember to do this. I am the most non-PowerPoint person, but I figured it would give you something to focus on as I run through some, uh, a lot of material here quickly. Um, <clears throat> first, I want to tell a very brief story. Um, Mark and I were chatting, and he reminded me that about eight years ago, not probably to this day, but maybe a couple of weeks past, I spent a year, I moved to Jerusalem with my husband and our two young children. And we were at the Church of the Holy Sepulchre with our daughters, one of whom was in the early years of elementary school. And we were all the way down towards the very bottom, walking up this big staircase, and my husband was telling a story about a time he was there and a fight bro broke out between two groups of religious. And my daughter's looking around and she's listening to this story and she stops and she looks up at us and she says, wait, Jesus was a real person? <laughs> I tell this story to bring your mind before I begin speaking to that edifice and the complexity of it, the structural complexity of it and the historical complexity of it. And I hope if time affords, I will return to that um, at the end of this, um, presentation, thinking about what encountering an edifice like that is for an American student, somewhere between the ages of six and 18. Um, all right, at the Religious Literacy Project, um, 
We understand religious literacy to be a skill-based competency that integrates knowledge and critical thinking in the service of recognizing and understanding the role of religions in complex contexts with special attention to questions of power, peace, and conflict. This entails the ability to discern and analyze the fundamental intersections of religion and social, political, and cultural life through multiple lenses. In aggregate, a sort of a robust religious literacy then depends upon a basic understanding of the history, central texts, beliefs, practices, and contemporary manifestations of several of the world's religious traditions as they arose and as they continue to evolve and it extends to the ability to explore the religious dimensions of human society across time and place. Our approach is thus non-devotional and academic, which requires teachers and students to draw a distinction between the devotional expression of religion and the academic study of various and varied devotional expressions. This point, which may seem very transparent to many people in this room, is one of the things that we find actually incredibly challenging for many teachers and students as they begin this study to grasp. Um, and again, I'll come back to that. Alongside drawing a distinction between the devotional and non-devotional and really exploring what it means to think about religion from a set of academic perspectives, um, we emphasize three key principles, which should be up there. Each of these principles um, responds to a very common misconception that drives religious illiteracy and we believe participates in the funding of conflict, misunderstanding, and ultimately forms of violence. The first is the notion that religions are uniform, which manifests in very common assumptions that many of us even those of us who are well trained find ourselves leaning back into. What do Christians <coughs> believe about this? What does Islam have to say about that? Oh, we know Buddhists are pacifists, so how <laughs> could? Um, in place of that, this un fundamental understanding that religions are internally diverse and they're diverse all the way down. So that when we talk about diversity and we're teaching teachers to think about diversity with their students, we're not just talking about the diversity of sects themselves or denominations within a religion or streams, but actually to be able to think when you're looking at a particular community that diversity is the result of both the intersection between different teachings and practices with various other forms of identities that play out on the ground. So diversity unfolds in communities in very complex ways. Um, secondly, the misconception that religions are static and somehow separate from movements of history, that there's a sort of essentialism here. And replacing that with a robust recognition that religions are dynamic, that they exist in time and place, and are constantly reinterpreted by believers. And this is obviously deeply connected to their diversity. Thirdly, the idea that religions function in isolation from their political, cultural, and economic contexts, so that we could discuss religion apart from these contexts. And that mis- um, perception we replace with an argument that the reality is religions are deeply, deeply embedded in culture and that we can't really understand religion abstracted from context and we can't fully understand culture, politics, economics without understanding the role that religions play in them. So we have this sort of mutual implication. So thirdly, from our methodological perspective, we draw heavily from cultural studies. And there are two particular streams here that are really relevant to the work that we do with teachers. The first is to support teacher, teaching and learning that provides students with the facility to recognize and analyze the complex way in which any given perspective is situated in drawing from responding to particular mm -hmm. contexts. And this includes and facilitates the support of students beginning to understand this about themselves. So that they come to understand themselves and their teachers as people who are also situated in contexts and are involved in an interpretive process that brings with it their own assumptions about religion, whether they're initially conscious of them or whether they are unconscious and need to be surfaced. And that those play a role in the process of how they come into the classroom to think about religion. This process of coming to be aware, this process of self-understanding, increases both awareness um, and the capacity for constructive intentional transformation in the classroom. 
Secondly, we support work, um, we work to support teaching and learning that attends carefully to how power functions, including cultivating a facility for teachers and for teachers working with students, for students to think about the ways in which social power operates with respect to inter intersections among gender, race, and class in the context of culturally embedded religion. This focus on social power helps students to explore how particular devotional forms gain power while others are marginalized. It also helps teachers and students grapple with the fact that the complex complexes we call religions are neither agents for good or bad on their own, but are harnessed by people in significant ways and mobilized to leverage power for good or ill. I think right here it's really worth noting that the ability to think about situatedness and to think about power combined with a solid understanding of the three principles I, out, I uh, laid out goes a long way to transforming the way in which conversations unfold in a classroom. And John will get into some of this when he talks, but it provides a constructive complex so that students can have conversations that otherwise are quite fraught. As students develop a facility with the relevant conceptual vocabulary, as they begin to recognize that there are authentic but not exclusive claims that can be made in a myriad of ways, they um, begin to engage with their classmates, themselves, and the broader world around them in ways that utilize discursive tools that allow them to engage difference and disagreement in the classroom in thoughtful, compassionate, and constructive ways. So um, curriculum design. Part of what we do, and as I segue out of this, I'll talk literally about our sort of resources and our training programs, but part of what we do is really work with teachers to design curriculum in a different way than many are used to. And so this is a process that I think about um, in terms of post holing and fencing. So instead of looking at broad survey classes that are trying to introduce students to a sort of superficial bird's eye overview. We work with teachers to begin to drop down deeply into particular contexts or complexes, like the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, and ask what would it take to understand this deeply? Well, and that's a question of what does it take for a student to want to understand this deeply? So part of what we're engaged in is a recognition that learning is a fundamentally erotic act. It's one born of desire, of passion, of a desire to master, to understand, and to transform how you relate to the world, what you can then do with your knowledge about the world. And that if that process isn't in motion, students don't retain what they're learning. But if you can drop down and engage on that level, they hold on to what they've learned and you have the ability to fence out to other areas. So that if you're dropping down deeply in very particular, carefully considered areas, you can link, you can fence in between them with simpler versions and they can see the connections and hold on to them because they're motivated by a desire and they're pushed forth by developing complex understandings that anchor, provide a way to anchor a lot of um, additional information as they move on. Okay, so lastly, how do we do this? So we, um, first of all, we spend a lot of time training teachers. I think over the past year, I've worked face to face with over 100 teachers now. Um, we do this through our summer institute we also do it by going on site and working individually with teachers or doing group, teaching, group training with teachers in various places. Some of those relationships develop into ongoing relationships. We now have teachers we've trained who are training other teachers. One of them is right here. Um, and so the process of, you know, we're involved in a process of trying to build out a network of teachers focusing on particular geographic regions where we feel like they're good relationships and there's a possibility to build sort of mini nodes and networks. Um, we also support teachers we've worked with in resource development. And some of that, uh, we're in the process right now of sort of in conversation with a number of teachers figuring out what kind of resources we wanna be focusing on developing that would be most useful in general. And we're looking at um, some particular things around assessment, around court, 
course and curriculum design, and then some particular resources around content for doing this kind of um, curriculum development. Then we also have been um, working on resources for a period of time. Our website features a set of case studies which uh, cross a number of the major world religions and um, focus on a set of themes um, within each one and provide additional secondary and primary res resources. And part of what we do is work with teachers so they can think about how to use a case study model, both to help teach their students and to help their students learn how to research and write themselves. Um, and in addition to that, we have been working on developing a set of resources for the teaching of US history that are connected to the AP US, US history curriculum, which is Rush Religion in US history. That's not live yet. It's still in a process of revision and being vetted. Um, alongside, we have you know, small videos that teachers use regularly, and then edX courses. So we sort of are toggling back and forth between working with teachers, hearing what teachers need, and also developing the resources that we think may be most useful. Um, and I think that you know, in closing, one of the most um, encouraging pieces of this from my perspective and what I've been seeing over the past few years as I come into classrooms and I watch students, I was in Chicago two weeks ago, I think, is really seeing the degree to which students are finding this work transformative and the way in which they are articulating an engagement and understanding of work in the humanities that isn't happening across the board. That there's a richness that can unfold when religion is factored back in and when we create the opportunities to engage in deep and complex ways that um, has significantly, I would think, you know, when I look anecdotally back through my own life, deteriorated probably through the degree of high level testing that's going on in the way in which the highest level courses have been indexed to the advanced placement exams and the kind of tyranny that many teachers or school systems feel that rightly or wrongly in terms of um, course design. So there's something about the richness and also the way in which this work, when done um, in a robust way, provides a forum for ethical engagement in the classroom. And I think it creates a kind of experiential model that students are finding um, particularly encouraging in this day and age as a real counterpoint to what they're seeing in the world, in the news um, around them. So, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah Ben. And now we'll hear from John Camardella, who's teacher of world religion at Prospect High School. I um, want to just give a special thanks to Ben um, for having me here. And I hope that what I'm able to share with you here over the next few minutes can, can situate myself just as one example, but then also sort of lead each of us to consider about what's possible in our own context. Uh, it's hard to not place myself here. Four years ago this month, I received an email from Ben asking me if I'd like to come to DC and just talk about curriculum development. And here I am staring out between the, the monument and the Capitol and, and trying to process what's happened over the last four years of, of my career as an educator. And sitting up here right now, I think as a high school teacher, um, I'm at Prospect High School in the northwest suburbs of Chicago in high school district 214. Uh, we have six comprehensive high schools and two alternative schools. And I am now in my 10th year of teaching a standalone world religion course. Uh, I started it in 2009 completely by myself, siloed as Ben said, um, and for five or six years drew on a lot of work of the people in this room, um, but also just tried to figure out a way to, to do it academically rigorous, but also constitutionally sound. And how would, how would you do that? And there's so many of us out there trying to figure out, because we realize we need to do better, but there's a lot of us that don't know how, and I was one of them. Um, my course is 40 weeks long, it's two semesters. Um, currently, and for the last five years, I teach it five times a day, uh, and I have 138 students. 
Um, and it's become a labor of love. It's become everything <laughs> that I do. Um, and when I say this, my story is, is both, I think, very common, but also really unique. And what I'd like to try and represent here is when this really became powerful was when I was able, as an educator, to articulate what needed to happen. Um, and then I was also able to garner support from my administration team, uh, both at the really sort of micro level, my division head, my assistant principal, my principal, but then trying to convince the superintendent's team to buy into what we were doing. Um, bringing that piece in was huge. Then finding subject matter experts to inform me and train me, because I knew I needed it, <laughs> and finding a group of scholars that would allow me access to new ways to think, uh, new ways to approach teaching about religion was very critical. And last but not least was involving our community. And I would say that that was when things really took off, is we were able to convince stakeholders that our community needed to do better. And I would say that those of us coming from all over the country, I'm going to share my own experience, but also try and think about how you might be able to, to do some community and relationship building in your own. Because I always start with the students in mind. So my class in particular, uh, it's all seniors. Like I said, there's 138. And recently, I completed my religious studies and education certificate through the Harvard Extension School. And it was a, an incredibly powerful program for me. And in doing so, I was able to then be hired on as an adjunct faculty member at Eastern Illinois University. And what we're able to do now and offer our students is a dual credit option um, where my students are getting both high school credit and a intro to religious studies credit. And what we've then seen is that last year was our first year and we had 109 students earn dual credit. And they took that then into college and opening up this whole new idea of humanities and religious studies that they had not really considered before. Now, I would not pretend to think that these students are all going into major in religious studies. Um, hearing back from some of my alums, and now uh, I was talking with Kate, I think we, we have over 1,000 students that have taken our program uh, who've gone on, and they're using their religious and cultural literacy in every field except being a scholar of religion, I think <laughs> is the fair way to say it. And, uh, and for us, I feel like that's what, what we're here to do. That's what we're here to sort of serve. Um, and so those students are, are really understanding a complex and nuanced way to understand religion. And uh, for the last couple of years, I've served as an education fellow with the Religious Literacy Project. And in doing so, we've completely changed how we assess students. Um, again, I'll say this, through the support of both my administration and also subject matter experts and scholars, we've gone away from scantrons as sort of this way of assessing and thinking that you know, winning a trivia contest is how you prove your religious literacy. There is a, a point to it, and I understand that, but in terms of like what are we reinforcing uh, with our students and what are we asking them to engage with as they enter this wildly diverse world, um, I would just like to speak to the assessments. You know, Our final exam in the first semester, we now take them to the Art Institute of Chicago and we look and we help them think about ways that religion and culture is embedded in art and in expression. Um, they have complete choice about what they choose. We give them a little angling uh, and we turn them loose and then they then come back uh, two weeks later and present their findings. Uh, in the second semester we do use the case studies um, published by the RLP um, for sort of formative and summative assessments for each unit and then by the end of their 40 weeks each student works with me individually, and they produce their own researched and written case study, which we then live stream to their parents and friends and scholars and, and make these students really own their research. Um, they can pick any topic they want, and the whole goal is to, to try and demonstrate how this is represented in this really specific situated context. And what we have found is a complete ownership. Um, I've become more of a facilitator and less of an expert, of which I am not. Um, I've watched where I've been able to stand back and help offer students support without driving their effort because it's, 
it's self-imposed, if you could say. They, they really start to buy in because it's what they're interested in. Um, and that really has been exciting for us in that transition. And then just the last two things I'll share is our work about five years ago, I'm into my fifth year, um, to really try and build community is every three, four weeks, I offer a free parent class. And what I do is I open up the library and from 7 to 9 p.m. on Thursday nights, I go through each of our units. We do 12 units, six in the first semester, six in the second. And we'll, on a low end, get maybe 30, 35 parents. Other nights, we'll have upwards of 70. And they come in, and for two weeks, I share all of our readings, all of our resources. I send out links to all of the videos we use. And what we notice is that the conversation is then being shifted at home, yeah. is that their sons and daughters are going home with this idea. And a lot of times, parents aren't sure how to engage. Mm -hmm. And now, with this extra opportunity, whether they're really interested in learning how we do this, um, but also, they just want to see how their sons and daughters are processing it. Um, and allowing that access, we've seen, has really shifted the really understanding and intelligence level of our community. And now, probably the most exciting part of what I do is, is to try and train teachers. And we have a partnership in our district with Quincy University. It's a small uh, school down on the Mississippi River outside St. Louis, where we offer internal university classes where we can help teachers. We have about 900 teachers in our district. Um, learn how to teach about religion and cultures in their own context. Mm -hmm. And so we're working with English teachers, humanities teachers, social studies teachers, and have even had a couple of math and art teachers mm -hmm. sign up for these classes to really help them be aware of how they're addressing religion and culture in their own context, where we feel we can make some really positive gains. Uh, and then lastly, our district is in the process. There are six high schools. Um, really exciting for us is that this year, um, Rolling Meadows High School and Wheeling High School have started teaching this course. Um, next year, Buffalo Grove will start teaching it. And in two years, Elk Grove will have five of our six high schools teaching this standalone religion class as we try and show that this can be done really well, um, but that it takes stakeholders from all parts um, to support this work. And being here today really makes me feel good. And I like because there are still challenges ahead. Um, but I hope that I was able to voice just a little bit in our northwest suburban area of Chicago that this, this is starting to move. Uh, I owe a lot of thanks both to the RLP, to Ben's support, um, and my own administration. And I look forward to, to speaking with you and, and learning from you as well as the day continues. So thanks for having me. Thank you, John. We have some time for conversation. I want to get the conversation started by asking the panel a question, and then we'll open it up so that you can be in conversation with the panelists. And uh, I want to start us off with the conversation about Ben's declaration that there's not yet a center of gravity, mm -hmm. and that, that and do we or do we not have a field that is K-12 religious studies education if not, why not? And I think we heard some hints from what Mike started out with in the beginning, or maybe Sarah Ben's comments about testing. Uh, but is there one, or is there not? And what needs to happen for there to be one? And whoever wants to jump in. Well, I guess it was my my uh, <laughs> declaration. So, mm -hmm. yeah, I I, um, I get the sense that a lot of people feel that they're working in isolation. Mm -hmm. And uh, I've had the opportunity to work at NCSS. There's now a special interest group for religious studies. Um, but you know, it could be better attended. And I, I think part of it is a challenge of religious studies in K-12 education that it's often, most often, integrated into other disciplines or subjects or fields. So religious studies is often taught in social studies subjects, whether that's US history or world history, or it's taught in a literature class in the context of uh, you know, when you're learning about Beloved, you learn something about the Bible to understand the references, or when you're learning about Night. Um, so because it's so integrated, which I actually think is a good way of teaching about religion, it means that religious studies teachers, or teachers who focus on the study of religion don't necessarily see themselves as uh, distinct, as religious studies being distinct. They see themselves primarily as a social studies teacher, or primarily as an ELA teacher. Um, and so that sometimes can, can create a challenge. Um, there are some teachers, like John and others, who do teach standalone religious studies courses. Um, and I think that they, perhaps it hasn't reached a critical mass, that people don't 
uh, see one another. And I know that RLP is working on a, a mapping study to look at the landscape of where religion is being taught. I think that'll give us some good data. Um, but perhaps that's one of, the ch one of the challenges. And then public perception, of course, about um, perhaps that religion shouldn't be taught. Although we, we, we should be a little careful with that. There was just the PDK, is that the acronym, poll? Um, which just showed that huge percentages of Americans and huge percentages of teachers think that religion should be taught about in public schools. I think it's in the 80s percent. Uh, I, I'd have to go check the number. But they just released it. It's an annual poll, and they just asked about the study of religion. And it was huge percentages who said that we should be teaching about religion. And then they asked a separate question of should we be teaching about the Bible. And a, a less percentage, but still a majority, said yes. So that's what we're up against is everyone, I think a lot of Americans are on board, um, but perhaps there's misconceptions about whether you can teach about religion and then it's just so diffuse. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Mike, just from the University of Northern Iowa. <laughs> <laughs> I, just, I know that they would care, that's why I say. Um, just to Ben's point, I, I just, these figures stuck in my mind, so I, that's why I recall. 74% out of this Thank thing, 75% of teachers want religious literacy taught. But the other thing that caught my eye on that is 69% of parents <laughs> want it taught. So we ought to latch onto that. My vantage point is, is more from higher ed. And I think there's a couple things that occur to me. Uh, I'd like to have a little conversation with uh, Tina over there since she's a teacher educator. Um, upstream, we're not getting it done in teacher education programs. and. Religion and education is, by its nature, an interdisciplinary um, work. And that is not rewarded in the academy. Uh, there's single disciplines. You're in religious studies, in some aspect of education. But at your peril, you will have a foot in both places. So you usually have to wait till after you're an associate professor. You get tenure to uh, uh, to launch out on that sort of a thing. So, um, but I think that we need to address this in service, wonderful job in pre service. Uh, I mean, in service, but the pre service thing I think is really critical to, to address. Shall we respond or shall we open? Yeah, John. I was just going to say quickly that uh, my, I did my undergrad at Illinois Wesleyan University in Bloomington, Illinois, and they had me down to give a quick speech back in March. and. Um, it was fun, a couple of professors at Illinois State University who trained teachers in the education and history, social studies departments heard. And in just sort of a fun way to talk about the center of gravity, I'll be going down next month because now Illinois State University, which trains quite a bit of teachers, uh, is looking to try and figure out how to do religion better. Try to, how, how are we going to do this? And so we're starting to feel, I'm starting to feel this, this shift. Um, and I think something like this can give us a lot more power moving forward with regarding how we represent what we do in training our teachers moving forward, you know, in our different communities and contexts. So we've got some there, momentum. There is definite momentum if mm -hmm. we can harness it. Mm -hmm. yeah. Great. Let's open up for conversation. Please. Bob Mattingly. I have a quick comment and then a question. Uh, the comment is obvious that we're going to this notion of uh, and just to be aware, as we probably all know from our different perspectives, there are people out there who want to take world religions and twist it as a kind of a covert way to push devotion, to save things. They've contacted me and how can I help? You know, I don't. But uh, <laughs> just to kind of make that aware, <coughs> and then I think it's towards these efforts to try to expand the teaching of world religions, we need to be conscious and alert to people who aren't in, in, in line with uh, that, this way of thinking. My question goes to Sarah here. Uh, at our uh, World Religion Institute a couple summers ago, where we had a group of uh, world religions teachers and we're kind of helping them learn how to do this, an interesting generational difference popped up that I'm curious at your perspective. It reminded me when you talked about your daughter. And some of the younger teachers, when they talked about how do you teach world religions, talked about how they have their kids do worship. So they have their students, one person is the priest, and they do this, and then another. So they kind of go through and 
some of the older people in the room were horrified and thought that was incredibly disrespectful. And what kind of came out in the conversation as they talked about this because they're together for a week is that the youngest teachers, I'm sure there are exceptions, um, really didn't think that kind of modern or educated people would really believe this stuff. Whereas the older ones maybe didn't believe it or weren't uh, uh, religious themselves but had a respect and kind of a uh, for religious worship. So it was interesting to me to see that generational difference. I was curious if, if you also see that at the liter Religious Literacy Institute and also if you have any suggestions about how not how to teach devotion, not um, making people devote, but helping people understand what devotion is and that this isn't primitive, so to speak, for mm -hmm. people. Does that make sense? Yes, it does make sense. Um, I think there's a number of complicated pieces to the question that you're asking. Um, I think the word about is really important, right? You're trying to teach about devotion. And I would imagine in this context, how devotion unfolds in a particular context within a particular tradition. Um, and I think that this is where we get into the importance of material culture and the importance of art, the importance of images, the importance of film, the importance of music, of sound, that there's a variety of ways in which, as teachers, or the, a variety of ways in which teachers can engage the sort of somatic elements of devotion without actually sort of play acting a devotional scene in a classroom. Um, and I also, you know, part of what um, we work through, and I didn't begin to touch in here, is some of the sociological theory around identity formation um, that we're interested in, in terms of helping teachers and students understand their situatedness within, as a form of emplotment within sets of narratives that allow them to make sense of the world. And I think that there are tools um, discursive and conceptual tools really available to work with teachers to help them think about the way in which we tell complex and robust narratives about reality, about the meaningfulness of life, um, that can help us understand the richness and complexity of narratives that we ourselves might find incre might not find credible personally. but. Um, part of moving into a really developed understanding of our own context and our own situation <laughs> is that process of recognizing the way in which our own lives are structured through sets of stories. <coughs> and I don't say stories lightly as something just sort of made up. So I think that um, there are ways to get at this um, that provide the ability t for teachers who aren't seeing, I think, the richness in, it sounds like a set, uh, you have a set of teachers there who aren't seeing the richness, the profundity, the depth of the stories and these actions that they're um, teaching about. And so from our perspective, the goal would be how in part do you unpack, help them begin to unpack that so that it's not like, oh, this is pretend from another era versus the credibility of modern science. Um, I haven't witnessed that in the way that you're describing it, but I absolutely believe it's that, that it doesn't surprise me to hear. And I do think that as we have a rising generation um, where more and more people have been raised outside of the context of institutional religion, certain aspects of institutional religion are gonna seem more alien and it's gonna take more work to help that, uh, help them understand how that might function and be meaningful in lives. Over here. Uh, can I just comment on that sure. question? And, and I think that that's why it's really important to bring in uh, the community members who actually practice, live their faith into the classroom. And if you look at this room right now, I don't know how many religions are represented in, you know, in this room. We're still being taught about Islam, Hinduism, and Buddhism from a Christian perspective, regardless 
of how well-educated the educator is, and I respect that immensely. Um, but I can, you know, I, I went to grad school uh, in, a, in a university where many of the, of the scholars were atheists and quite frankly denigrated religion, quite frankly. I mean, I, you know, I, it, was, it, was, it was difficult to survive in that environment. That's part of the reason why I didn't pursue a, P, uh, pursue a, P, a, P, a PhD in that particular university. Um, and I think it's always thought that a person of faith couldn't teach about their religion in an academic way, which is completely false. Um, we do it all the time. I am a, I'm a, an Orthodox Muslim. I practice my faith quite religiously and quite consistently, but I am able to present my religion in a very, I don't, I don't sanitize my religion. I complicate it very much and I talk about the good, the bad, and the ugly, and, and, you know, and, and sort of address current events. And I think that there might be why there's so much interest in, in learning about religion because of current events, because of what's happening in the world around religious conflict. So I think it's incredibly important to involve and have Hindus teach Hinduism. And there are many different Hinduisms. Um, you know, it's not just the sort of the Hindu American Foundation that is doing this teaching, there are other Hindu organizations and they have their own perspectives on what Hinduism is for them and the same thing with Muslims and, and Buddhists and so forth. So I think it's incredibly important to involve the community to bring that to life because I think that people need to understand there are people that are actually living their faith and they believe in what I think many atheists would consider to be magic. Uh, you know, something that isn't, you know, I believe in revelation. I, you know, I believe in prophecy. I believe in heaven and hell. I believe in all of those things and, and, and really guides my life and I think that kids need to interact with, with people like me. But they have to, but the, the people that you bring in absolutely have to know how to do this in a way that isn't preaching or proselytizing and is not sanitizing the religion but addressing the reality of lived faith on the ground. And it's a mess. <laughs> it's a double-edged sword. Um, so um, I think that that's incredibly important. And I think that people uh, you know, like me, would like to see more of that and not just Christians doing that teaching, but people in those communities doing the teaching or supplementing that teaching. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Please. I think religion studies in American schools are so important that it needs to be required. And so I have written um, journal articles about actually having Carnegie units related to religious studies uh, at the junior and senior level. I think we can learn quite a bit from the UK where they have separate religious studies courses. And when you analyze their uh, problem, the problem is they don't have highly qualified teachers that have majored in religious studies. So that's the criticism. They've got an incredible curriculum, I think. Um, and it's, you know, it's very analytical and thoughtful. Um, and you can look it up. You know, it's available. Um, and we could benefit from it. Um, I'm not sure that we need to start it as early as they do. But the problem is then with you know, we only have so many Carnegie units because of the peculiar nature of our schooling history. So what do you knock out? You know, what would you displace to put in one or two Carnegie units? You know, a, a Carnegie unit would be two classes. I'd go with, you know, if we could get one Carnegie unit and have two classes that would be required and they would be taught by religious studies majors that have an ed certification so that they know how to work with students. That's why I'm so impressed that you went back and got a religious studies certification so that you're well prepared to teach world religions. And I think they should teach, they should have a course on religion in America and how religion evolved in America and the religious diversities within America and then a world religion um, but I think it should be required. We can't just keep having these electives. So, um, comments? And it does not get taught. I've worked with English and with social studies, 
religion does not get taught yeah. very well and very deeply. Right. And or only one day is spent. Classes. Or only one, one day, day or two days is spent. And this is why when, when we create that center of gravity, I think that we need to take, you know, going back to the question about center of gravity, I think it's really important that we um, uh, create uh, models for the teachers that are only going to spend one or two days. Well, we've tried our best. I mm -hmm. mean, I love these infusions that we've just developed. You know, uh, the religious strand and the D3 framework is very nice, but it's the lived curriculum, and it's not happening. And, and, and it will not happen uh, because it's too cramped. Yes. The curriculum yes. is way too cramped. Right. And history, and, and, and one of my students, that she did his dissertation on what's happening in English. And there's the the religious literacy of the teachers is 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 not there. They cannot. They don't have the religious background to to teach um, Canterbury Tales. Yes, thank you. We want to make sure we have time for a couple more comments or conversations. Shireen. Yes. Hi. Um, so I think I mentioned earlier my name is Shireen, and I work at the Media America Foundation. And I think I've been there. other organizations that talk about Hinduism other than HAL. Well, we are the only organization that creates material for teachers who teach about Hinduism. And I'm a little bit surprised to hear that come out of your mouth and to hear that perspective here because I wouldn't go around and say, well, if you're going to have somebody come in and talk about Islam, don't go to IMD. Give other perspectives. I find the purpose of today is to be collaborative, to encourage each other, and to support one another as we work for our teachers and our students at Hindu. It's not to maybe bring in some of the issues with other organizations into the discourse. So I just would really appreciate it moving forward if you got something to say about the Indian American Foundation or if you would like to address something, you maybe tease it out in your letter at the end of the I believe there was a conversation. Yes, please. What I'm hearing is that, yes, we know teachers are not prepared, and we need, um, there are resources, there are paths forward, but what we have not talked about is the, uh, the situation, the context, and the context in this country now is a polarized context, and as we think about where the intersection of politics and religion today, I, I just think about the opposition from both ends. And one, of course, from uh, those who are non-affiliated and who are atheists who certainly don't want this taught at all. And from the other end, uh, folks from religious groups who are only interested in proselytizing uh, and who don't want other religions, or religions other than their own taught in school or believe that when they are taught, it's an instance of, of being proselytized. And while they may appear to be friendly to you, and I guess in my role at SPLC, I, I see them more. I know that educators are afraid of encountering those things. They're afraid that if they teach about uh, the golden age of Islam, mm. <laughs> that they are going to be um, accused of bias. Right. Or that if they teach about the five pillars, that they are going to be literally accused of uh, converting children by force. Mm -hmm. um, and so I do think that any discussion about the future has to include a really good argument for why um, that is going to address those obstacles of either not believing that it's important or believing that, in fact, only my religion is true. Exactly. Yeah, well, she's got two minutes. Can, so. I, can I just comment about 
uh, and this is really, this speaks to the importance of, of not being caught up in the spokesperson syndrome where only one organization um, represents the religion. I think that it's incredibly important. If you go to our website, we have hundreds, we have 100 organizations that we work with. Um, you know, in, in just in the Muslim community alone, we work with uh, the Institute for Social Policy and Understanding that does a fantastic work on, on Islam and Muslims. We, you know, we train speakers from mosques and, and other Muslim organizations to go out and do this work as well because we're very much um, interested in presenting the diversity, the pluralism within each of these, w within each of the communities, including, uh, including Islam. So I would encourage people to avoid uh, the spokesperson syndrome where only one organization or two organizations speak for the, uh, for the religion. And that, that, that was the context of what I was saying. It wasn't, it wasn't at all to, to make a comment on, on, on one organization, but just to sort of say that it's important to get these, um, the diversity. So I, I agree with you. We have one minute left, and we're going to let Ben talk about the why, I hope. Sure. I'll, I'll just be very brief to answer, to, or to address perhaps um, your point and to talk about a question related to who do we involve in this conversation, which I hope we talk about for the rest of the day. There is a, a challenge to invite many people to the table, or I, I guess an opportunity to invite many people to the table, and then we have to balance um, the various interests that these groups bring. So I think it's important to bring community members into the conversation about what's taught in schools, but I would say that they should not have a veto power over what is taught in schools. Um, I was in Albania recently working with the Ministry of Education there, um, and when we were trying to int introduce the academic study of religion into Albanian schools, um, I met with the head of the Albanian Orthodox Church and the head of the uh, Al uh, heads of Albanian Catholic community and Sunni community and Bektashi community, and they all wanted to know who would be teaching these classes. They wanted to know if members of their community would be teaching these classes. And I had to say over and over again, they will be taught by teachers who are trained to teach about um, religion, whether or not they themselves are religious. And so I think that we need a balance in the conversation, and I hope we talk about this uh, throughout the rest of the day, is who is qualified to teach about religion? How do we make sure that community members know that you don't necessarily have to be a member of a religious community to teach about <coughs> religion, although we invite all to the table to have a discussion about what it means to teach about religion in schools. And so that's playing that balancing act with, if you're a school administrator, if you are a teacher, is, is, is very delicate. Um, but hopefully, if we have more robust conversations about the academic study of religion in schools, there will be increased community buy-in to the fact that it is necessary to teach about religion and that teaching about religion academically is not an attack on any one community. And I think, uh, to be frank, very practically, there are resources. Um, Charles Haynes, I know he's been invoked many times, brought together people <laughs> across the religious, political, and ideological spectrum over decades. Mm -hmm. And you have everyone from the Christian Legal Society to the American Jewish Congress to uh, you know, the National Education Association sitting down and saying, we disagree on many things, but we agree on this is what it means to study religion academically. And I think when we tap into those sort of safe harbor documents, um, we can allay many community concerns. And of course, there will always be some people who, who are less uh, interested. And so then we can have conversations about opt-out rates and other things, but, but I think um, most people just don't know that these kinds of agreements exist across a diverse spectrum. Please join me in thanking our panelists for this conversation. Thanks. So um, the next thing that we'll do is move into small group discussions, and Larry Pasco will be um, uh, facilitating that. Uh, lunchtime conversations are really productive and generative, and also it gives us time to be humans, where we talk about each other's families and things. But we would like to come back together so that we can try to stay on track. Um, Maureen has done Herculean work to try to synthesize the things that we've said, and so we'll be talking about that before starting the afternoon panel. So thanks, Maureen, for, for leading us in this conversation. Okay. Well, what I normally would do um, in this kind of an exercise is I'd work with myself or with one other person and try to synthesize and group all of these comments. Uh, it turns out that I didn't quite have uh, the physical setup or the time to do that well, but I think I've gotten a sense of what's here and I'd like to share that with you. Um, the first thing that struck me is lots and lots of people talked about the need for public education 
and public education, I'm going to throw my voice a bit, um, uh, kind of the need to speak to a broader audience, the need to, um, to, to, the need to make the case, the need to not only speak to, uh, to teachers and administrators, but really to involve the community. And out of that, associated with that, there were a lot of, we need to have more interfaith dialogue, we need to bring in a lot of different stakeholders. Um, many people kind of ask the question, what are the goals? What is it that we're trying to achieve? Why are we trying to do this? And, they, and I got the sense that they'd like to come out of this meeting with a defined set of goals. Several people rose, uh, raised the issue of the faithful opposition. You know, opposition from people of faith who in fact do not want other religions taught in schools and the question of how do we bring them on board? Or if, if not, how do we bring them on board? Secondly, how do we overcome that obstacle? There was definitely a call for research. Research along the lines of we need data. We need to know how to assess our, um, our impact after we've set up some goals. We need to have some kind of an audit or an inventory of what's already out there, uh, both in terms of textbooks, uh, curriculum, but also what's going on in the world, who is doing this teaching, who is not doing this teaching, and just get a sense of you know, an environmental scan. There were also questions about, oh, networking. A lot of folks said it's important to build networks, be collaborative within organizations, basically figure out, don't build something new, figure out ways to get what's out, what we've already built out there in better ways. Um, at the same time, there was another related conversation that, well, that was more about messaging and kind of related to public education in a way, but there was a related uh, conversation about where this should happen, about whether we were looking really at a religious literacy course, whether we were looking at a world lit uh, religions course, or whether in fact uh, the education should be beyond the world religions course and integrated more into sub other subject areas. And what was very clear is that that's a lively and ongoing discussion. Um, how to do training. Lots of folks are looking at different ways of doing training. Uh, how do you, and I think that uh, as Maha said, and I apologize, where are you? Where are you, Maha? There you are. I think I, I pronounced your name correctly this time. Thank you. I apologize. It's one of Teaching Tolerance's main points is that we should always learn how to pronounce people's names before we say them, and I did not do that. Um, but basically, what kind of training? Do we need it in pre-service? Do you need to have really a top-notch teacher training program? Is there the possibility of doing this online? How much like real personal time do you need? What about training non-expert teachers? Is that possible? That's the, uh, the uh, Muslim advocates um, approach. So lots of ideas about what shape and form training should take. Um, Lots of thoughts about let's, let's come up with some next steps. People generally expressed a lot of uh, admiration for the group in the room and felt that a lot of the right people were here and that it was really important to move ahead and identify next steps. And finally, and I know I'm missing some things, uh, finally someone raised the issue of funding. <laughs> you know, how, where, where's the money going to come from to make whatever we decide on happen? So those are some of the um, observations that I pulled very, very quickly from the post-its um, before turning it over to the next step. Is there anything that anyone would like to add or any kind of uh, comment? I firmly believe in wait time. Yes, Ben. <laughs> Actually, I'm glad you said that because that was one of the things I forgot to talk about. <laughs> no, a couple of people had also talked about, had kind of connected this to social emotional learning and to identity <laughs> formation. And while we have always, you know, we started out basically 
trying to reduce prejudice. We're much more than that now. We're really about making schools that are inclusive and equitable for all students. <coughs> but inclusion and equity means that you have to be able to bring your whole self to school and not have part of it, you know, believe that there's part of you that you're not able to bring there. So at this point, the basis of our project is um, found in the social justice standards, which I think I mentioned before, but everything that we do really builds off these social justice standards and they reflect our vision. Identity, that children very young should have a very clear sense of their social identities and what it means to have an identity, that identity is fluid, that it changes over time, that there's all sorts of things, but that it's something that you can choose and that other people often choose for you and they should be curious about the identities of others. That's what we want. We want uh, to raise up a generation of children who also not only have an appreciation of diversity, but understand its strength and understand how to express curiosity about other people's identities. Thirdly, we want a young, a new a generation that is committed to justice, and that is to fairness and to the idea that we should not, uh, people should not be disadvantaged or privileged because of their identities. And finally, that they should know how to work together to change the world, uh, to take informed action in the face of injustice. And in a nutshell, that's kind of what everything teaching tolerance does. So what we do about religion is we do in fact try to share resources that not only attack um, myths, specifically, uh, you know, lately I'd say we have, we, we have uh, resources specifically uh, about sick Americans, uh, combating Islamophobia, uh, looking at how anti-Semitism uh, manifests in schools, uh, which is increasingly frequent but also just about ways that teachers can approach <coughs> teaching about religion without preaching. Um, so that's basically what teaching tolerance does and I think it fits in here because lots of folks talked about the need to recognize this as part of a person's identity. Okay, and with that. We have, we have a little bit of time if you have another question. Okay. I did not get to all of these, so if there was a thought that you had that you felt that I did not capture, please say so. Maybe, uh, could, could you read it? What are your thoughts going into the afternoon or when you're talking about the teachers? Sure. Um, I think there are lots of good models out there uh, that we can follow as to how you bring about change like this. Um, and maybe part of the work should be to identify those models. Uh, I personally think that you need both a bottom up and a top down approach, which is, uh, and somebody mentioned supply and demand, but it's kind of the same sort of thing. You need to have the demand coming from both the top and bottom. Um, let me talk about something that we've recently done, and it might be an example. Um, last year, we uh, put out a, um, a start a new initiative called Teaching Hard History American Slavery. And what we did was that, first of all, we at simultaneously, we wrote a report basically that said the way we teach the subject is dismal. And we uh, surveyed high school students, we surveyed uh, teachers, we took a look at textbooks and we also took a look at selected state standards and came up with the, the, the argument that we don't know a lot about it and we don't teach it and the other part of the argument was that it's really important because the reason we don't teach well about slavery is because all of the issues are still here. At the same time, we put out a framework for how to teach about slavery. And we brought together a, uh, a scholarly team and a team that also included teachers and uh, um, folks from the University of Wisconsin Press who had uh, published a book, the editors of that book. And we put out a fairly exhaustive framework, which by the way, we have since revised. But we now have a framework for K to five. And K to five was, was really, really tricky because it's not about teaching history in K to five. It's about teaching basic concepts like what does it mean to be free? Uh, what does it mean to be in control of your life? Uh, that took longer to do, but we now have that framework. 
and we identified some of the problem areas, and there are some really big ones. One, slavery was a southern institution. No, it wasn't. It was a national institution, too. Uh, slavery was sort of just a chapter in American life. No, it is foundational to American life. Um, three, uh, it, um, it, 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 the South was backward. The economy was backward. The fact is, of course, that the value of enslaved property at the beginning of the Civil War was more than the value of all the railroads, all the canals, every, you know, all of this northern wealth combined. So there's lots and lots of myths out there. And what we did is we got other organizations to endorse it. We uh, have worked with a lot of scholars. We've built a network. And then we started sending it out. Rosanna knows that uh, I've been kind of working at all levels. And we've really worked at all levels. We've tried to, we've talked to folks at the state level. And there are some states, uh, including, I believe, Virginia, that is about to really look at their whole history standards and think in terms of how they can do a better job. We're working with museums. Um, and housing sites uh, like, like Monticello and uh, Mount, not so much Mount Vernon, uh, sorry, thinking about Mount Pelier. Uh, and they are part of a movement to have more descendant voices engaged as they represent the history of their sites. Um, we're talking to textbook publishers. And then we had this wonderful thing happen, which was that the New York Times did the 1619 project. <laughs> And I don't know that that's going to happen anywhere else, but I'll tell you that you know we already had our materials out for over a year, and then they did that, and luckily I knew it was happening, and we tied in the launch of our revision to that. So my, re my advice, <laughs> don't reinvent the wheel. You've got enough content. What you need is a public education campaign. You need to raise awareness about the issue not just in the educational audience. You need to make the argument that it's part of restoring dem democracy. And, and I say you, but I mean we. Um, and at the same time, we have to start networking with people so that all of these materials and this expertise can be easily found. I think the other part, though, is really building teacher capacity and administrative capacity. This is going to be a very contentious issue. And I think that the more we can uh, lower the guardrails or increase the guardrails and uh, make it, give people tips for how to anticipate the opposition and find common ground is going to be incredibly important. So that's my opinion. <laughs> Thank you all. <laughs>